I don't know how many are familiar with the hike, but um, when I moved uh, from Iowa to Western Washington, and I lived in the Linden area when I was an engineer, I had to take advantage of the mountains. I mean, we don't have that in Iowa. It was one of the draws to get me here. And one of my favorite hikes that I did in that first summer was Mount Si. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's near Seattle, um, and, and it's a, actually a, a pretty well-known hike. Um, and it started off as things typically can do in the in Western Washington in the summer, a really nice, um, sunny day um, and we started the hike and we made our way up but we had been warned that there was the potential for a storm to come in and sure enough the marine layer came in and the clouds came in just as we were at the top and I'll never forget coming around the corner and just being overwhelmed by the cloud and the darkness that's there what a difference it could make just in one spot it being sunny and on the other side uh, literally, you could feel the cloud, um, never really had experienced that, and the fog had just set in, and it was kind of precarious for us because we had to kind of scamper down some, some rocks, but the fog really limited what we could do. I want you to think about that today. I want you to think about you, the time that you've been in a really foggy situation because this is really the dominant theme of our text, and if we want to understand the passage today, this this idea of fog and the power of it being cleared is at the heart of it. And so today, um, we are finishing up our sermon series that we've been doing called Love Where You Live. It's a community series, and we are one of 10 churches that are participating in it in the city of Battleground and surrounding area. Hawkinson um, community is as well. And it, I want to tell you, it's actually a really cool thing. The pastors, we are all friends. We meet every Thursday. And it's been neat to hear how God has used it in every uh, different church and kind of the excitement that's there that we're all doing it together. But one of the coolest things is last week, Saturday, we did a service project. It was a rainy day. They had 60 people show up. We told them we would have 50, so that's good. We over-delivered. Um, on top of that, it was rainy, and the head of the city was so shocked, of the department who was in charge of it, was shocked that people actually showed up. And then he made the comment that it was surprising to him that in a rainy, soggy day where they were picking up leaves and doing all that, that the people actually had a good attitude and it seemed like they liked each other, even though they didn't really know each other. And um, the city sent a post out on their Facebook page that said, uh, love where you live, thanking all the churches that participated. And twice they used our sermon series title in their Facebook post. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty cool, especially when people drive around and see the same banner. My daughter made that comment to me this week. She's like, hey, they got the same banner that we do, um, and they see that kind of unity, and so it's been kind of a fun thing. And so over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the different ways that we can love our neighbor, why we do it, all that. And so today we're going to deal with the topic of obstacles that keep us from loving our neighbors. And we're going to be turning to 2 Corinthians 4. We'll be looking at the first six verses. You can turn with that in your Bibles. Uh, the page number, I think, is found in your bulletin, if you, or just go about, uh, probably about three quarters of the way through, um, and, and you'll find it. Um, it's Acts, Romans, and then the two Corinthians, and then there's Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Um, but if you want to follow along on the app, you can read it. There's a link there to our sermon notes and the Bible passages there as well. But 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6 is our passage, and this is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not our ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, and to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, and displayed the face of Christ. Now, as I said, we've joined nine other churches for this sermon series, and there's been a calculated kind of um, flow to this, this series. Uh, if you remember, the first week we looked at Philippians 2, and we addressed why should we love our neighbors? I mean, what's the point? Are we just trying to be a good, I mean, a good influence? Well, yes, we are, but there's a deeper motivation for that. We want to serve our neighbor because Christ first served us. 
And we want to be, show that kind of same love to others. We looked at Philippians 2, 5 that said, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. And so what we remembered is we looked at what Christ gave up, uh, where he temporarily lay aside the divine, some of the divine attributes, even though he's 100% God and 100% man, but gave up things like being all-knowing, all-powerful, temporarily while he came to earth to come and live in amongst us. And I, I want you to think about that great kind of shift that happened in him. Because that motivates us to love other people. It motivates us to give up of ourselves and to humble ourselves and to serve others. And the second week, we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan and we asked the question, well, who is our neighbor? And what we saw is that our neighbor is everyone, especially those who are in need, and even those that are difficult to love. We, we, we looked at it and said that we can't use the excuse of, well, they're just not like us or they're too different than us. Rather, we're called to serve those that God brings in our midst, those that he's put in front of us, and those are who we're called to serve. Last week, we looked at how do we serve our neighbor, and we, we looked at First Peter 4, and we saw that there are practical ways that we can show hospitality and the unconditional love and practical acts of hospitality to them. And, and above that, it said, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And use the gifts that God has given us. And, and what we saw is that each of us are wired by God to serve. That God has wired you and I each differently to serve in different capacities. But he's done that so that we can be a blessing to the world around us. That we can serve them. And the challenge for us was to think about the ways that we've been gifted. And the practical ways that we can take care of people. Things like we saw in Matthew 25. Food, drink, clothes. Uh, visiting them, inviting them into our homes, and inviting them into our lives. And we do that. But unfortunately, even though we know all this, there are certain things that can kind of keep us from doing that, the obstacles. And I think there's three that are listed in this passage. But before we look at those, it's important for us to see that this passage really communicates the process that God uses to ignite a, a believer's faith. Because if we don't get the process down, some of these things, these obstacles, can kind of overwhelm us. And so I want you to think about this. The, what is the process that God uses to ignite believers' faith? Now, I kind of set this up with the story of the fog. And some of you may have looked at this and said, I didn't see the word fog in your passage at all. What are you talking about it being the dominant passage? Well, the Greek word in this, it's called kalepto, that is translated as veil in this by the NIV actually referred to cloud in, uh, in um, Exodus 24. If you look at it, there's a Greek Septuagint, which is basically the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. It uses that exact same word to talk about a cloud that descended over the mountain when Moses went and, and spent time with God. And so I think that the word uh, fog is actually a very apt illustration for it. It's this idea of things being covered and dense and cloud and being unable to see. Now, yes, Baal works great in that connotation. It kind of shows that it, their eyes are blinded and maybe doesn't have the kind of overarching thing. But fog is a very real and good analogy for that as well. And what this passage reminds us is that non-believers are in a mental and spiritual fog. That they cannot understand the truth because they are blinded by Satan. That's exactly what this passage says. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so sometimes we can wonder, like, why is it that people don't get it? Why do we kind of face this world that uh, sometimes it feels like as Christians we're swimming upstream and that, that it seems like things are getting darker? Well, there's a reason for it. Satan himself is at work in the world around us, and he has clouded the minds and clouded the spiritual sense of the people around us. This is, the, this is just the reality in which we're in. Now, if you think about fog, we had a foggy day here on Wednesday, and Amelia and I were driving to school, and she uh, saw it and right away was kind of bummed. She's like, Dad, I hope it's not foggy at school. Well, I told her, bad news, kiddo, because anytime it's foggy here, it's always foggy there. That's just, she's in a spot where it's always foggy. And I said, well, why don't you want to go there? And she said, well, because if it's foggy, they don't let us play as much, and I want to be able to play on the playground. And so she asked me, she goes, what can we do to get rid of the fog, Dad? I mean, can we just get rid of it? And I said, well, that's not the way things work, kiddo. 
Um, unfortunately, you, there's two ways you can get rid of fog. You can't just blow it away and make it disappear. Um, either the sun has to burn it off or the wind has to push it out, right? I mean, fog, as, especially that really dense fog, just kind of sits and hangs there. Um, and it will stay in those spots where the sun doesn't get to it or the wind doesn't get to it. That's why certain spots actually tend to be more foggy. And, and unless this outside agent works to kind of uh, dry it out and kind of burn it off its the sun or blow it away, the fog remains there. And what this passage tells us is this is actually the way that God works as well. That God shines the light of Christ's grace into believers' hearts and empowers them to believe. It talks about Christ being the sun that comes and eradicates the fog around people. The language is very much that way in this passage. For God who said, let the light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And so there, even though this world is full of spiritual darkness and there's a fog around that keeps us in this kind of mental and spiritual phase, that Christ's light shines and burns the fog around the hearts of believers and ignites their faith. He ignites it. He opens their eyes to it. Another way of kind of thinking about it is that you and I are a lump of charcoal. Now, the charcoal itself can't ignite that flame. Rather, it, there needs to be a light source there. And, and that light source is Christ himself who ignites the faith in our hearts and enlivens it. This is the kind of imagery that, that, God, that Paul uses to describe the process. There's a mental fog that is, uh, um, seems like it's insurmountable, but the love of Christ and the grace of Christ is the sun that wipes it all away. That the heat of it removes the blinders and allows people to see it ignites their faith. And this is the way that God works. But we also see here that even though God is the ultimate who does all the work and is at work inside of this, that one of the primary methods that he uses is the Christian sharing the gospel with non-believers. I mean, Paul talks about this. He talks about the fog, the spiritual haze. He talks about how God's light shines in it and kind of warms it up and removes the fog and invigorates somebody's heart. But he also says that he's actively involved in the process. He's preaching. He's announcing. He's spreading the gospel. And we need to remember that the way that God often works in people's lives and has worked even in the lives of here is by Christians having conversations with people, sharing the gospel message with them, but not just sharing it, but that their lives actually line up with it. And that's really the challenge of what we want to have in this sermon series. And the reason why we did this as a community together. Because we wanted our community, and we wanted to challenge the churches to remind them that we are the ambassadors of Christ. With our mouth and with our actions, that those two things need to come together. And so this is the process. Yes, there are people who are in a spiritual fog around us. There are people who do not know Christ and do not know the truth. And all of us are even in a somewhat of a state of fog as we learn more about who God is. But God in his mercy is the sun that burns that fog away and invigorates their faith and ignites it and, and helps us to put our hope and trust in Jesus. This is the process. But you and I have the potential to be part of that, that process by sharing the gospel, by speaking the truth to them. And that, this is what we're called to. This is what we're called to. But yet we see here that there are also some obstacles. I said that in the beginning. This is the, the theme of it. But if we, if we think that it's all about us and we just have to work harder, then it's going to feel like this huge burden. But if we understand the process of the way that God works, we see that we're not doing this on our own, but rather we're joining the Spirit of God and God himself in this mission. And so we see that there's three obstacles that can keep us from sharing Christ's love with others. And I think in this verse, there's also an anecdote to it. In other words, we know there's, there's a medicine that can go against it. We fight against that. And so this is what we see. The first obstacle is fear. And I want you to think about that. What are those things that keep you from serving others? Maybe going outside of your comfort zone. Maybe it's we're afraid to talk to people about Jesus because, I mean, isn't that what our culture tells us? Like, we can talk about all kinds of things that are superficial. We can talk about the Oregon Ducks or the Washington State Cougars. We can talk about the football team or we can talk about what movie we like. But we're supposed to stay away from two categories, politics and religion, right? 
You never, I mean, I went to a restaurant one time and that was their rule. It was nine bar stools and it was just a counter. And that was their rule. You're not allowed to talk religion. And they even told me that when I was a pastor. And I said, what do you do? I'm a pastor. They said, we have two rules here. No politics, no religion. The funny thing is, is the waitress started asking me about religion. And then I was like, hey, it's okay, right? But there's a, there's a, a push against that, right? You, you can, you're not really supposed to talk about those things. So maybe there's an internal fear there that we have. Maybe there's even a pressure because some of the things that people think that we believe, they think we're narrow-minded or judgmental. And, and they will make those kind of comments. And so it's, it's a, you're afraid to speak up. Maybe we're afraid that we're going to say the wrong thing and make things worse. Maybe we're just afraid of putting ourselves out there and trying something new. Uh, because we don't know if we give that help, if it will actually accomplish what we want it to. Or maybe they'll reject it. And in that, we'll feel rejected. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that we can be fearful of. Paul here says, acknowledges it there in, in 2 Corinthians 4.1. Therefore, since God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. He acknowledges that there's the potential there. And he encourages the people to not lose heart because whether we like it or not, when we put ourselves out there in the world, when we serve others and we learn, love others, when we sometimes have to absorb kind of the pain that comes from putting ourselves out there and trying to be this presence of love, even to the people that are hard to love, there's a fear there. What's it going to be like? Am I going to be able to handle this situation? How will I handle it? Because things get really complicated. And that fear can bind us up and keep us from inaction. But what Paul says is, we don't have to lose heart. We don't have to lose heart. And, and we don't need to do that. He says, we don't have to be fearful. And the reason that he gives is because God has saved us, and he's the one who's given us this ministry. It's not to focus on the fear, but rather to think about the process. And the process is, we, this is not about us. The process is, we're joining God on his mission of warming the hearts of the people around us. He's the primary mover. We're just the secondary ones who are helping the cause. And so it's, it, what we need to realize is we're not alone in this. That God has put the people in our past. He has put that difficult person at work, that kid at school that needs to be reached out to and loved on because no one else is doing it. We have that neighbor there who maybe has some physical needs that we can take care of. And it's all there for a reason that we can step in and display the love of Christ to them. And so it's not about us, but rather it's about joining him. And so we remember, one, the motivation that Christ loved us and enough and he saved us, but also that he's given us this ministry. And so even when it's hard, we know that God is at work with us. And I, I want you to go back. I'm going to go back to the slide here. But look at 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to talk about what Paul had to go through. It says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, that we despaired of life itself. So I want you to acknowledge what Paul does here. He doesn't act like, hey, you know, how are you doing? I'm doing great. No problems whatsoever. I'm not really that afraid. No, no, no. He actually says, look, I've gone through a ton of really difficult things. I've despaired to life itself. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty dark, right? I mean, that's a fear. And if you, if you know the story of Paul, that guy's gone through all kinds of stuff. I mean, shipwrecks, pun, uh, imprisonment, threats on his life, literally beat to the point of death that they just leave him out on the side of the city because they think he's going to die in a matter of hours. And he's gone through all of that. And yet, because he understands how God works and his role in it, he says, I don't have to fear because God is at work. I'm just joining him on that mission. And I need to trust that God's spirit will be there even in the midst of those scary times. Even if it means me going out on a limb and maybe serving in a way that I've never done or trying something new that I've never done. Because it's his power is made perfect in weakness, he actually says later even in the, this verse. And so what we see is that fear can hold us back, but we need to remember. We need to remember that we're not doing this on our own. That God saved us and he's given us this ministry. He's empowering us to do this. 
And so our trust isn't in ourselves, rather our trust is in what he does. And so I want you to think about that this week. What are those fears that can keep you from kind of trying new things or maybe reaching out and talking to people? What are the ways that those limit back? But also remind yourself that God is greater than our fear. That his love pushes out that fear and empowers us to move. There's another obstacle that we see here, and that is a lack of integrity. He says, not doing the acts of service that God has called us to do. I mean, that's really what I'm talking about here. He says in uh, 4.2, rather we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. And what do you go, if you go back to the letter, you'll see that what he's trying to do here is comp- uh, contrast himself to other preachers who are all about making a buck. I mean, 2 Corinthians 2, 17 says, Unlike so many, we did not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. And what he says is we need to be careful here because sometimes we can put religious language on things when we actually have selfish motives. That we can say, oh, I'm, I'm trying to do this, but in fact, we're, we're really trying to get our own desires. And so if we want to show people the love of Christ, if we want to display the love to him, we got to search our own hearts and we got to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Am I doing this to get honor and glory for myself? Am I doing it just so I feel good? Am I doing it so that I can prove to the world that I'm actually can do what I set out to do? Or am I doing this for the service of God? Now, it's okay to feel good for serving others. God wired us that way. He wired us so that when we do good and we serve in the use of our gifts, that we we have the sense of, "Ah, this is what I'm made to be. And so it's not that that is itself and a bad thing, but if that's the only thing we shoot for, and we're unwilling to put ourselves out there if we don't have that feeling, then we need to question, what are my motives for doing this? Again, a lack of integrity, not doing the acts of service that God has called us to do, is, is one of those things that can keep us from doing it. It's hard sometimes. We don't want to put ourselves out there. Let's be honest. There are people in our lives that we would just rather speak bad about, treat them the way they treat us, and just be a jerk to them because they're a jerk to us. And we can make every excuse in the book for doing so. But that's not the attitude that Christ has called us to do. That's not the way that he's displayed us to do. And so we need to, to not buy into, we'll just treat other people the way that they treat you and, and go back and forth. No, no, no. We need to be following the example of what Christ gave us and how he loved us, even when it hurts and even when there's a cost. And I want you to think about this. Serving other people, especially those, like the story of the Good Samaritan, who are very different than us and who are sometimes even hard to serve, it's going to be a cost. There will always be a cost. There will be a cost of our time. There are costs of our resources. And I think, honestly, sometimes the more difficult cost is the emotional cost. We, we, We don't like to have those hard conversations where we challenge people. We don't like to love people and continually reach out to them because we know that they're going to have a bad attitude. It's draining being around those kind of people. I mean, there's just some people that we know it's going to be an energy suck, but yet this is the way that God's called us to be. And again, what's, how, how do we fight this? Well, we remember the depths of what Christ sacrificed for us and that we are called to follow his example and serve others. That's why he says it in 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So what does he do? He says, look, there may be out there people who even preach the gospel for their gain. And honestly, this is a good litmus test for those preachers on the TV. Are they hucksters trying to make a buck or are they preaching the gospel? But it's also a good search for ourselves. Are we willing to serve even if we don't get the kudos? even if we don't get the pat on the back, even though it's hard. And are we willing to do that? Because we know that's what God's called us to do. And the only thing that we know is that we're serving as Christ served us. That's the only kudos we get. It's not from anyone else. It's just from the Lord who says, well done, good and faithful servant. And we don't always feel that all the time, right? We don't always sense it. So sometimes that obstacle, that not wanting to do the hard things can keep us from being loving others and showing the love of others. And so we need to fight that. 
But we need to constantly remind ourselves what Christ did and why we did it. The last thing is just sometimes we're unable to plainly share the gospel. Paul says it here in 4. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. What he says is, hey, there are going to be times where we have an opportunity to share the gospel and we need to be prepared. 1 Peter 3 actually says, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, always prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And for some of us, maybe one of the things we just need to do is we need to actually like think about, what, what if somebody asked me, what is the gospel? How would I answer it? How, how would I answer that question? If I literally am doing what God called me to do, and people can see something that's radically different about me at work, and they go, why is it that you hang out with so-and-so all the time? Why are you, even though I know you've got all kinds of stressors, I know what you have in your life, why do you still have hope? Or why do you not badmouth the people who are actually badmouthing you? What is it that's different? Are we prepared for an answer? Sometimes we're not as prepared as we think we should. And I, I would just encourage you, in this passage, the language that he uses is that he's setting forth the truth, which is the truth of God's word, not necessarily the truth that we need to make up. It's not of ourselves, actually, what is what he says, but it's the gospel itself of Jesus. And so I want to challenge you this, this week and throughout this month or whatever to actually spend some time thinking about memorizing Bible verses that preach the gospel. And here's the thing. Constantly repeat them to yourself. And let me give you a reason why. Because whether we like it or not, there's a lot of times where we need the gospel preached to ourselves. Because we buy into the devil's lies. We buy into the devil's accusations. We, we buy into his deception. And we need to listen, make sure that the voice that's in our head speaks the truth of Scripture. And not only that, parents, we need to preach the gospel to our kids over and over and over again. We need to preach it to our spouses and remind them of God's unconditional love for them and that God can use their gifts, that there's value and worth to them. We need to preach these things to them. And the only way that we'll do it is if we, we think about it. And it's a cognitive decision that we spend some time thinking about the gospel and its implications to us. One of the, 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 so I want you to think about that. How would you answer that question? If somebody said, why are you doing this? I hope you present the message that we heard that, that well, I was a sinner. And Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what that means is that we don't live up to God's standards. We admit, you know what? I don't even meet up to my own standards. Let's be honest. I'm going to be this kind of a, I think I'm going to be this kind of a husband. Let's think. I actually think I'm going to be this kind of a husband and father. In reality, where am I about this one? Just ask my kids or ask my wife, right? Uh, I have to apologize for being frustrated or, or short with them. Although today they were rock stars. So I could just say, hey, thank you for getting ready in like 20 minutes or less, you know? Um, but oftentimes I'm like, come on, guys, let's go. we got to get out the door. The red school bus is on its way. And I can get short with them. I have my own standard, and I don't even live up to that. God has his standard, which is even higher than mine. And if I can't meet my own, I have to admit that there's no way of me meeting his. And what we say is that that's true of all of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 and further than that, Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so even though we're sinners, and even though we've blown it, that here's the deal. Our relationship with God was destroyed, but God in his kindness didn't leave us in that state. Even though he had every right to treat us with justice and to punish us as our sins deserve, his kindness was overwhelming and he fixed the problem for us that we couldn't fix on our own. He came as a human and took on human form. He lived the sinless life that you and I were called to live. And he faced a horrendous death because of it. But not just that, that, that horrendous death physically. Crucifixion is brutal. You read it. It's terrible. But he suffered an even worse death spiritually because he suffered the wrath of God for our sins. 
But he did it because he had a purpose. He wanted to provide a way for us to have our relationship with God restored because the punishment was taken care of. And so you can use that. That's really Romans 3.23 or 6.23. Think about that. Sin, salvation. And now say, that's why I'm serving you. That's why I'm loving you. Why? Because Christ first loved me. And because I've been so impacted by the love of God, it's changed who I am. Now, I'm still a work in progress. Your pastor's imperfect. I will tell you that right now. But I'm striving more towards the goal of what God has said. And so I gave you other passages that talk about this too, just a few there. Romans 5, 6, 8. You see it on your bulletin. You see, at just the right time when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Those are truths we need to remember. Because you know what? We need to preach that, to the, as I said, to the world around us, but we need to preach that gospel to ourselves. Because in those moments, when we are aware of our sin and we doubt whether or not God can love us, because we think we need to prove that we're lovable to God, we need to remember these passages, that God still embraces us in that sin. And so it's just not an exercise for the external, it's an exercise for us as well. And we need to remember passages like Ephesians 2 that tells us, for it is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this is not ourselves, it is a gift. And here's the thing about gifts. I don't deserve it. I did nothing to deserve it. That's the point. It's not by works that no one can boast. But then he gets to the service part on verse 10, which we sometimes forget. For we are all God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do the good works, which God prepared for advance in us to do. And so for some of us, I want to encourage you just to think about that. Don't let fear overwhelm you. Remember, God is at work. You're just joining him on the mission. Don't give up on doing the right thing just because it's hard. Remember that you and I are ambassadors. Our job is to display that selfless, unconditional love of Christ. But also, let's be prepared to be able to speak the gospel plainly. Let's learn those verses so that we can preach not only the gospel to others, but to ourselves. And that we can build our lives on that truth and bank on it, even in those most difficult times. And trust that the Spirit of God is at work in us, even when we don't see it. That He has worked in our hearts, even in those difficult times. And He can use even those difficult challenges to, to help us grow in our faith with Him. This is the message we need to impress upon ourselves and be prepared to give when people ask but when we face those things. So this is really the gospel message. And I can't think of in, in a better way for us to celebrate this than to take communion. And so here at Crossway Church, we take communion every week. And I want, we're going to come and we're going we're to sing through a song. We're gonna, I'm going to lead you in that song after I pray. But communion is our chance to enact the gospel message and to practice it every week because it reminds us that our minds were at once foggy. We had no clue. We were so bound up in our own things that we didn't even care about God. He didn't even seem like he was on our radar. But God in his grace blew that blindness away and enlivened our hearts to empower us to put our hope and trust in him. But he didn't empower us by doing it, by making us a good person. And all of a sudden we got our act together. No, 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 no. It's exactly in the state of brokenness that he embraced us. And so when we come here, we remember that we do have fear. That we do have not always displayed the love of Christ the way that we should. And that we can buy into deception and we don't remember the truth. But we know that God embraces us in that state and he can use it to help us to grow in our faith and becoming more of his ambassadors to the round, uh, uh, around us. And com so communion is that time when we can come to the Lord thanking him for what he's done, feeling convicted of areas that we can move, 
but also being faithful that he will, reminding us that he will be faithful and continue to work in our lives beyond it. And that he has put us here for a reason and for a mission. And we want to join him on that. And so I invite you to take communion if you profess your faith in Christ. But before we do that, let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it. And we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.